Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Pioneering Pensions. For those who don't know me, my name is Stefan Lundberg, and I have a passion for pensions. Pension is really important for everyone, and it's part of the social security. It's about financial wellness later in life, and we can learn from each other in the industry because if we can make something better, everybody will benefit from that. And in this webinar series, we interview people who pioneered pensions, done something different we all benefited from. And today, I have the pleasure to present Claude Lamoureux. I met Claude when he was on Ontario Teachers a long time ago, and a lot of his thinking has inspired me the way I look at pensions. So I'm very happy to welcome you to the webinar today, Claude. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here, and a good afternoon to everyone. I think the story about Ontario teachers, where Claude was the chairman and the CEO, is the poster child of the Canadian pension model, which we all heard a lot about. But that was not always the case, as I understood. So Claude, can you tell us about your first impressions when you were approached for this job? Okay. One, I'll correct you. First, I was not the chairman, and I, I really believe in having a strong board. So uh, the, the chairman, his name was Jerry Bowie. Uh, the, the Ontario Teachers' Pension was created in 1917. Up to 1990, it was a government-run organization. In 1990, the province decided to create an independent organization, independent from the government, to run the Ontario Teachers' Pension. And they name as chairman the uh, somebody by the name of Jerry Bowie, who uh, was governor of the Bank of Canada uh, for two terms, for 14 years during the uh, tough inflation years of the 80s. So when I was hired, I essentially was told that my job was simple. Up to, up to that point, Ontario teachers only invested in Ontario government debenture that were non-marketable, non-assignable, non-negotiable. So I was told, and there were no investment people, it was certainly a service organization. So I was told that my job was simple. I had to create a you know, strong investment operation that will invest in the marketplace. And the board at the time also thought that the uh, Ontario government debentures we could not touch. So when I arrived there, uh, one of the early moves that I was involved with was hiring a person by the name of Bob Bertram that probably many of you know as a chief investment officer. But when I look at the plan and I talk to mainly to all, a lot of the employees because I, I really like to have discussion with low level employees. If you want to know what goes on in an organization, that's where you start. And they were telling me about, you know, what are you going to do about this problem? What are you going to do about that problem? There were so many problems. At one point, somebody tells me, well, uh, what are you going to do about the 10,000 letters that we have not answered? And, you know, then you start asking questions. Well, if somebody wants to retire, you know, they have to wait a year. So I went back to the board and essentially told them, look, I will create an investment organization. But on the administration side, we have huge problems, you know, not only in the in the service to the teachers, but also it took something like 90 days to close the book at the end of the month. So there was a, a whole bunch of things that. I didn't plan to, to work on, but you suddenly you're up your sleeve and you say, okay, uh, Bob can work more on the investment side. I will make sure that we provide good service to the teachers. But that one, that took a lot longer than I ever expected because to change system and, you know, we had people that were resurrected, you know, I, I won't bore you with all the details. We had to rec recalculate the pension of everybody, everybody that was in pay and the future pension. So that involved about half a billion dollar, if you want, of money that had to be re, re, rearranged and, and cost to the fund. So I'll, I'll, if you want to know more about it, I can go on on that. <laughs> I think we all know how difficult it is to deal with administration. And I think even today, many organizations struggle with it to get it right. 
Uh, I was thinking more about the investment side. So when you started, the, when Bob took it over, there was nothing there. It was a blank canvas. How did you approach it? There was nothing there. I mean, the formula was simple. You know, the investment, the return was Ontario Hydro plus a quarter percent. So when Bob got there, you know, obviously we started to hire some people and I, I certainly got involved in the hiring of people uh, because at the end of the day, that's, you know, the most important uh, group that, that you have in an, in an organization. So we look at what we had there and, you know, we wanted to come up with a strategy. But rapidly, Bob, you know, came up with the idea that we could swap the Ontario debenture return for the S&P. And when you want to do that, obviously you consult with lawyers, is this legal, can we do it? And, and we got at least the approval and then you go back to the board and say, oh, by the way, we can invest, you know, the free cash flow at the time was 3 billion a year. But we could also, you know, <laughs> accelerate the diversification by using swap. And at the time, this is early 90s, you had the, you know, Orange County and the borough of Amersmith in England uh, that, that were in trouble. So, uh, you know, first you have to convince your board that that's legal. Uh, Mr. Bowie, having, you know, knowing very well how the federal government works, told me, well, I want a letter from the Department of Insurance you know, that supervised us, uh, the Department of Finance, that one, it's legal, that they understand what you're doing, and that they're in agreement with, you know, you doing that. And and we did that. And initially, also, the paper suddenly got hold that you're using swap. So if a journalist called us, instead of saying no comments, I would invite them to the office, and if Bob was available, the two of us would explain what we were doing, what kind of what swaps were, how they work, how we were protected, and you know the accounting that we did, and you know it also <laughs> you need good accountant to make sure that everything is is properly uh, uh, taken care of, and that's that's how we got going. At the same time, we also were investing in the market. But the big, you know, I remember, I think our initial swap was probably a billion dollars swapping the return of Ontario debenture for an S&P 500. So we did a lot of that and we were probably one of the largest user of derivative at the time. Yeah, and these days it's quite a common thing that pension fund do. So that was new territory. I was wondering when you're doing this how important was the governance of your organization you, you mentioned your chairman and how, how do you just make sure that you could make the right decisions one the the chairman had been involved in hiring the new board and he hired a number of people that were you know i would say the the initial board was eight people three were people that were I would say very knowledgeable in finance and uh, you know so they were very very important but we also had you know a lawyer an hr person uh, somebody that you know knew the uh, administration from a government uh, standpoint of the uh, education system and we had two teachers <laughs> mr Bowie, in his wisdom you know, the government had named five people and the teacher three. And the teacher wanted parity and everything, uh, which eventually we, we got there. But he approached the uh, union and said, look, why don't you put two more people knowledgeable about investment on the investment committee? That's where most of the big decisions are going to be taken. And I remember the question that a lot of people had, which was, what happened if the vote is 5-5, five, five, he said it will never happen. And it never did. It never did. Most of our decisions were unanimous. So it was very important to have a good board that understood, you know, the importance, uh, at least, of the, uh, the investment process. At the same time, when they realized that the administration was weak, we eventually had to get rid of our external auditor 
And, you know, again, we hired an external auditor and my approach was very simple. I wanted the best team that you could get. And so we did a request for proposal and my request was I wanted half the bill to come from partners, which is doesn't happen often. And also, uh, you know, I wanted this team to be, you know, let's not talk about fees. We'll get to that when we select a winner. And the board was very surprised by that. But my approach was simple, is that if you want to go fast and if you want to, to do innovative thing, it's, it's like a racing car. If you have a strong motor, if you want to go fast, you need fast brake. And in a way, having good auditor and good accountant is very important in a large organization where there's a lot of money, uh, you know, that, that comes in and out. So that's that's why I've always believed. And, you know, I was involved with a friend of mine, Stephen Jaroslawski, in creating the Canadian Coalition for Good Governance, because and in Canada, we were successful in convincing all the corporations, and we did it slowly, that the chairman should be separate from, should not be a member of management, you know? And we started with the big banks, they all adopted that system. And today I would say most of the Canadian corporation have that system where the chairman is an independent person, not a, not a member of management. So, you know, Obviously, a teacher, we practice what, I, what I, we preach and that the chairman was independent and we made sure that we attracted good board, board member, knowledgeable board member, you know, to the board. I remember a speech that Paul Miners uh, gave. I think he did a study in the, in the UK on uh, institutional investment and he gave a speech and uh, 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 one of the points he made, he said, when, when he went around and interviewed people, one of the questions he would ask to uh, board member or trustees, if interest rates go up, what happened to the price of a bond? And something like 40% didn't know the answer or were not sure about the answer. I can tell you at Ontario Teachers, one most, you know, all our director knew what happened. And to me, it was very important to have them knowledgeable and in investment. On swap, we had, you know, one of the person that eventually replaced Bob Bertram, Neil Petroff, who did, I don't know how many presentations to explain how swap works. So that way, we wanted to make sure that they understood where they were risk, what kind of risk we were facing, so that you know, you need to be totally transparent if you want to have a good board. Thanks, Claude. This can actually bring me in to the question that Amelan Roy had to you. And instead of me repeating the question, let's roll the tape. What would your suggestion be to countries where you do not have the same kind of autonomy that was afforded to OTPP and CPP in Canada, where the government stood behind them? Oftentimes we find in other countries, you don't have the same kind of uh, backing from the government. And secondly, you also had very, very well-educated investment people on your boards all the time treating pension funds as a business. What would your minimum criteria for financial literacy be as an advice to the UK government, as an advice to the US government? Well, on the board, you need some balance. You need people knowledgeable about investment, but you need also people knowledgeable about law, about HR. So, but when, when you invest, you, you gotta, you gotta work hard. And, uh, you know, I was involved in creating the board of the uh, Canadian uh, public service pension investment board. And, you know, I, I was asked because I quote, I remember the deputy minister called me and said, uh, would I chair this committee to, to select the board? And I said, look, I have a conflict of interest because if I see somebody very good, I will suggest them to the Ontario teacher or the Ontario government. He said, yeah, 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 we know that. Uh, but we understand you're independent and, and you will, you know, we'd like you to do this. So I said, okay, but, you know, I want to make sure that I 
you know, I, I tell you what I, I have a conflict of interest. So the key is that you need knowledgeable people. And these people, you know, and the Ontario government is a great, the Ontario Teacher Federation is a great organization. Mr. Bowie convinced them, yes, you can have teachers on the board. And yes, they can make a, a difference. But this is a financial organization. You need to select people that know investment. And in their bylaws today, I think that the maximum number of teachers, the number of director today has gone up. But, but I still think that they can only name two people that are active or retired teachers. And we've helped them over the years. And we, you know, Jim, Jim Leach started that. We even paid for people, you know, for a headhunter to help them select good investment people. You know, to me, and I remember I, <laughs> I once suggested uh, somebody that didn't live in Quebec. I was losing one of a, a fabulous uh, director who had been chairman for a number of years. His name was Robin Cortals. He had been with the Toronto Dominion Bank as the president, and I was losing him. So, but I knew somebody in the province of Quebec that was equally good. And so I suggested this name to the province of Ontario. And the deputy minister looked at me and said, well, he's not from Ontario. I said, you're right, but he's the best that I can get. And, you know, he will ask me tough questions. And the first one I'll be able to answer. But when we get to the third, he'll probably make me realize that I ought to go back and do some more work. So I tried to convince the government and the union that we needed knowledgeable people, that we needed people who could keep our feet to the fire, provide them good explanation. And too often, you know, by the way, I've, I've worked with the, some in some country, you know, I was asked to help some countries that are less developed. And one of the things that I said, if you don't have the what you think are the, the kind of people that need to be in charge of a large amount of money, you got to get look outside of your country. You can get, get other people, and that doesn't mean that the people from the country cannot be there, but if there's not enough people that are really knowledgeable that you can trust, you got to look outside. And in the case of Ontario Teacher, this has, you know, they've always selected good people, but again, we've tried to help them make that selection. We provided them with name, and the same thing with accountants and the same thing we, we had uh, you know one of the best actuary in Canada and at one point the board wanted to do a request for proposal to try to save money and I convinced them no 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 this is money well spent because this guy knows more I'm an actuary he's full disclosure <clears throat> knows more than me and yes I can find somebody cheaper but I'll keep him as my own consultant because I appreciate some of the comments that he makes. Thanks, Claude. And I was thinking, I mean, we talked a lot about how important governance is, but also when you you did it with swaps, that was new, never done before, and, and you develop it. I know you did it with infrastructure, forestry, farmlands, and a lot of other things. So what would should be your recipe for someone who says, I want to do something different? What are the things you should think of based on your experiences? for someone today who, who says, I want to invest something I haven't done before? Well, first you got to do your homework. You got to make sure it's legal. You got to do, you know, get as much information as you want. You got to prepare, you know, most new things take a while to be adopted by a board. So you cannot just arrive and say, we want to do this. You got to talk about it. You got to inform them. You got to, you know, bring outside people if that's necessary uh, to convince your board that that makes sense. And so that, that's the first step. Make sure that you bring the right kind of people as your employee. Well, you can use outsider. I'm not against using outsider, but our approach was to manage 80% of the money in house. You know, teacher as a large, for instance, a private equity firm, we started that within the first uh, year and a half that that we were in existence. 
and you know we can talk about why so you need to be able to convince your board and not just the board but also the member of the plan that you know what you're doing you know an annual re every year at teachers we had an annual meeting that would last two three hours with tough questions and i i only stopped you know the, the meeting only stopped when we had to answer all the questions but at the same time you need to educate the government you need to educate the people the member of the plan the in our case the ontario teacher federation we made many many presentations to them about different aspects not so much on investment but with ontario teacher was mainly about different aspect of the plan you know, I've taken the time to go and meet with minister to explain to them, you know, our annual report, what's important, where, 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 you know, I never wanted to hide anything. And I've always told the board, I will be totally transparent. If I don't do a job, you can, you can just fire me. But the important thing is to be transparent with everybody. And if you have a problem, you got to disclose it rapidly. You cannot just hide it and hope that it will go away. And, you know, when we made mistakes, I made sure I called the board and, you know, and if it could wait, you know, I would normally talk to the chairman, but, uh, you know, and you always make mistakes. Investment keeps you humble. I can tell you that uh, I've made my share of mistakes in hiring sometimes the wrong people or doing certain things that maybe we should not have done. But the important thing is to do your own work and to be very well prepared and question yourself all the time. Claude, I was thinking when looking ahead, I mean, you you were pioneering and, and Bob and other people pioneered a lot of investments, you know, infrastructure, forestry and farmlands, as I said, and the risk premium that has gone down because now it becomes what people do. If you would sort of look today and say, as a long-term investor, what is the sweet spot today? that you would sort of pursue if you would still be in the role you were? Well, if, I, if I'm a small, you know, a small pension fund or a small institutional investor, certainly one of the things to look at is investing in index fund. Don't forget, you know, 80% of the managers don't, don't beat the index. So that, that's one thing to keep in mind. But if you're a large, you know, organization, uh, you can do a lot of, you know, th there are opportunities to invest all the time. And uh, I know you, uh, you know, mentioned that to me once. And so I started to think about, you know, where would I go? The next day I look in the paper, just in New York City, <laughs> to change all the windows in the commercial building it will cost $21 billion. That's one city. You know, so there's opportunities to create what I call platform. <laughs> Teachers own probably one of the largest, I think probably still the largest real estate company in Canada called Cadillac Fairview. And this is what I call a platform where you can do different things. We, we treat it, you know, although it's owned 100% by teacher, it's really run by people who know real estate. We've kept them separate from the fund itself. It has its own board with people that are knowledgeable about real estate. And this is a platform. They have something like close to 100 people involved in development and redevelopment. So looking, thinking of a platform, uh, if you own, for instance, sport, or if you, if you want to specialize, to me, I'm, I'm big on, you know, let's specialize in different areas that that you can and, and there's opportunities you, you look at the, you know the energy today you can get out of oil but maybe you can help oil company and gas company and energy company in <laughs> reducing the carbon emission that they do uh, i think the easy the easy solution is get out you know you look at, at wind power solar power i mean you can buy one of these large company or at least be a, a large shareholder and help them redevelop that in the emerging market in the emerging countries there's a, a need for the, the this sort of thing just the transmission uh, unfortunately I, I can give you an example 
we bought a large transmission in one of the Kenny uh, uh, electric line, transmission of electricity in one of the Canadian province. What did the government do? They decided, oh, you're not taxable, so we'll, re we'll reduce the return that you can get. And I can tell you that burned us to invest. In fact, we invested more in infrastructure outside Canada than in Canada. And every time a Canadian politician would ask me, how come you're not here? I would give them that as an example that what they should not do. Uh, and, but to me, the, the, there's, you look at, you know, recently the, there were a problem in the U.S. with one airline, uh, Southern Airline, which is a fabulous airline, but their systems are old. And, you know, especially the system to reassign crews and things like that. You look at Boeing. Boeing, I read a book and recently I read an article that said Bo Boeing, the, the last big, uh, the, the famous MAX airplane is a 50-year technology. But they've also said, oh, the next plane, we won't start it until the year 2030. Why? Because everybody's looking at their rate of return, at their compensation. Maybe there's room for pension funds and large investors that think long-term to help these companies think differently. You know, when we bought essentially a company in private equity, one of our initial questions was always, what are the things that you could not do before that you would like to do? Instead of trying to get as much cash out of these companies, I think for a large investor, it's a lot easier to say, you know, let's, let's modernize. A lot of electrical companies, a lot of energy company needs to modernize, and, and th there's room for that. So you you can partner with engineering firms to do that. And you know, every every day I can, I read the paper, and there's always opportunity, and uh, you know, to to invest in new things and to think differently, and and to approach people. Uh, if you want to be in private equity or if you want to be in infrastructure, you have to be in sales. You have to approach people with new ideas and eventually uh, some, some of it will stick and you'll be able to invest money and make a decent return. So, Claude, one thing you, you brought out, which I think is quite important, is the difference in investment horizon and, and you know the short-term return versus being long-term profitable. And I think with the energy transition and dealing with the climate change, that seems to be a big problem why not more is happening. Have you seen anything or have any ideas on how to speed up that to be kind of, instead of sort of just looking good, as you said, actually doing good? Well, if you look at, I think there are some pension funds in Canada that are, you know, involved with that. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I've done, you know, I can give you an example, but I think that that is easy to repeat. Uh, Omers has invested in a company, uh, Omers, the Ontario Municipal Retirement System, has invested, for instance, in a, in a company that provides air conditioning to all the big buildings in Toronto. What are they doing? <laughs> They've essentially take water from the Lake Ontario bring it and you know they, they've created a, a, a giant heat pump if you want and they provide you know the energy to uh, air condition a lot of the big buildings in toronto and this is something if you want to talk about a platform that could be repeated there's a lot of big cities normally big cities are near a, a place where there's water and you could repeat that you know probably around the world instead of using carbon uh, you know, gas or even electricity. You know, it, it takes some takes some electricity, but to me, this is a great idea that can be repeated in, in many places. But as I said, the Canadian pension funds. I'm more familiar with those. Many of them think in terms of platform as opposed to just making an investment. You create a group of people that specialize in one area. And they eventually can can <coughs> can bring different ideas to cooperation. I, I just have to tell you an <coughs> anecdote. 
because when you talked about this heat exchange or, or air conditioning in my hometown where I grew up in, in Sweden, they had a big paper mill and they basically got a lot of heat <coughs> out of the process, which could be used in the winter because it's kind of cold in Sweden to heat. But actually the municipality didn't want it in, in the in the early years. So there was a big fight there, and eventually they, they took it because it was kind of stupid to pump this energy straight in, into the water. But you can see how the world has changed today. Everybody will beg to get it. So it, it's a good transition. But I agree with you. It's important to have the platforms. That sort of is one thing I took away. Uh, I'm going to open up now for questions from the audience. And Bernard has a question for you. Bernard's question is, I know the fund is renowned for being an investor in infrastructure. Can pension funds contribute to national development by investing in infrastructure? Or do they have to stick to investing only in brown projects because green projects are too risky? Can recycling, as per in Australia, play a role insofar privatization of public infrastructure provides money to governments to invest in new green projects? I think it was more than one question in there, but yeah. what's your take on that? Well, you look at Australia, you know, what have they done? And, and Teacher has, has made a lot of investment in Australia. And, you know, a lot of the road are private. Uh, and again, the government, you know, came up with a legislation that, uh, you know, uh, gives a decent return to the investor. Many of these investors are pension funds. And, you know, so th this is an example uh, that, that one can use. The problem with many of these investments, governments want to do things that are free. You know, if you want a new bridge, uh, for instance, there's a, there's a new bridge that was built in Montreal. Initially, it was going to have a, a, a it was there. You would have to pay a toll. Well, it, the government said nope. We, we don't want that, and so it's it's free. You know, many of roads today. You know, I mean, roads are not free. Uh, the same thing applies there. You know, you look at pipeline. You look at transmission line. Uh, you know. I don't see a pension fund doing it themselves. You, you know, we're not engineers. We're, you know, you got to know what you're good at. And, and we're good at, you know, providing investment. Uh, in the case, for instance, of a road in Toronto called the 407, I remember we did not participate in the equity because we thought it was going to be too long. But eventually, uh, we participated in it by offering a uh, real, you know, real return bonds to the people who owned it. And the owner at the time was an engineering, engineering company. And the CEO told me, you know, and by the way, this was a new idea. It had never been done. The bankers were, oh, you know, they, this, they will not want that, blah, blah, blah. Well, the owner of the, uh, the CEO of the engineering company says, when I saw what you guys were offering, I said, wow, this is an, a very intelligent solution. And by the way, the intelligent solution came from two or three departments of teacher getting together as opposed to just one looking at it. Because, you, you, got, you know, there are silos within an investment organization. But to me, I've always said we're much better when we break the silos and people from different areas work together. And that's how the idea came up. And we offered a very long dated bond where there was no interest payment for a long time, just helping them get going. And eventually, and gave, this project gave us a real return. So, uh, you know, with index pension, it was very advantageous for the Ontario Teachers Pension Fund for the member, but it was also advantageous for the province at the end, I think they won. They have a road that runs very well, is well maintained, where they have to keep investing. If you look at a lot of roads, even highways, a lot of times government let them go. But once in, you know, if government focused on one thing, which is coming up with regulations, uh, I think that investor can respond to those, make money. And for the government, it's something they don't have to worry about. 
And actually, Claude, what, what you're saying is because you have long liabilities and this is a project and basically a, a, the economic lifetime of the project, you can be there as an investor. It means the one who's building it is getting a much better deal from you than from a bank, right? So you find your little niche there in terms of having the liabilities. Yeah, well, in this case, the bank didn't want us to even to present the idea of real return bonds. It was like, why would they do that? Well, for them, they were not comfortable with real return bonds because they also have their own little box and that yeah. box is wanted fixed income, period. No, no, we came up with the idea, it's fixed income, but with real return. Uh, and, and so with imagination, you can come up with solutions where everybody wins. We have a question from Larry, which I think goes back on this theme of liabilities. He says, how do you feel about investing in an asset only basis versus hedging liabilities? Is there a role for hedging liabilities? Question mark. Well, let's start. I come from an insurance company. Uh, you know, a pension fund essentially sells annuities. So you always have to think about your liabilities. You know, I mean, the one thing that, uh, you know, uh, we had a great risk group of teachers uh, that was involved in demonstrating the risk with the liabilities. And when you... And that's why the the example I've just gave of the real return bonds. Why did we do that? It's because we have a liability that is indexed. So, you know, maybe we didn't talk too much about that, but it's, you know, it's important to know why you're there. We were there to pay pension. We were there to reduce the risk of teachers, making sure that they could count on their pension. So we were very conscious of that. And, and that's why it was very important to have good actuaries explaining why we were doing certain things. And the investment people were very much aware of the kind of investment we wanted. And, you know, we wanted to match the liabilities as well as possible. And you can do that, for instance, by lengthening. You know, most bonds are way too short for most pension funds. That's why when you have an opportunity to influence, for instance, uh, an organization to say, oh, we want a 40-year real return bond that doesn't pay interest for the first 15 years or only pays a portion of the interest. We'll roll that because we need this for, to cover our liabilities. So I can tell you, uh, I'm glad that the question was asked, but you know, you got to be conscious why you're there. If you look at the Canada Pension Plan, for instance, they invest a lot in equity. They could invest 100% in equity because their biggest asset are future contributions from the members. And I can tell you that they've done a, a, a fantastic job of investment by being conscious of why they are there. They're there to pay pension eventually. Claude, I think there's also another interesting, this might be a geographical question. So in, in Europe, you have something called Solvency 2, which is sort of a regulatory framework that you do mark to market of your liabilities. And then you have something called liability driven investing attached to that. Uh, and I think in Canada, you have a, not that kind of regulatory regime. What, what What's your opinion on that, so to say? Because it's like different schools there. And I think maybe that was what Larry also were looking towards. <laughs> Well, mark to market is a bit of laziness. You know, for the accountant to say that, oh, here's the value based on maybe a quarter of 1% of the shares of a company uh, being traded, that determines the value. Uh, you know, there, there, there's a small investor called Warren Buffett who makes a ton of money by looking long term and looking at things differently than most people. So in, in, in my view, uh, you, you can estimate the kind of return you're going to get on your liabilities and you should not be, you know, told to discount based on the government rate of return. You have to be conscious of that, but at the same time, you know you're going to earn more than that. 
And to think that, you know, you have the right level of liabilities. I mean, the right level of, of liabilities, I'll find out when the plan, pension plan terminates. So I think that people and, and maybe a lot of governments have been influenced by accountants who think that to discount using, you know, the rate of return on government paper is the right one. It should influence you, but it should not drive how you value your liabilities. And even the asset relying on, you know, mark to market, again, you know, we've seen last year, a lot of companies lost 10, 20% of their value. Many of these companies are worth more than, than they were selling at the time. Uh, and, you know, I have no problem in making sure that, you know, their value at that, at teachers, we had a very robust way to value our, you know, private equity. Uh, and, you know, we try normally not to overvalue them. But if you look at the liabilities, I think that, you know, government and a lot of people are overdoing it by forcing you to discount at the rate of, of uh, you know, of government paper. But, you know, when, when real returns are zero, how are you going to value your liabilities? You know, they, they're, they're worth an infinite amount. That's not the case. Yeah. So we have a question here from David. It says, having the right scale seems to be very important in what you have managed to achieve with Ontario teachers. In many countries, the scale is with the investment managers rather than the pension funds. Is that a problem or should the investors press the investment managers to do a better job? Scale can be an advantage. Why? You have opportunities that are different than, you know, and when I talk about scale, once you get in the 10 billion range, your scale is pretty large. I mean, you, you, you're a large investor, but compared with, you know, CalPERS, compared with other funds, compared with Sovereign Wealth Fund, yeah, you're small. But I think that, again, you have an opportunity to focus in different area. In fact, too many, you know, many of the funds are over diversified. And, you know, and, and people, you know, don't think of it like that. But, you know, over diversification costs you money. Uh, look at, you know, one, one can learn a lot from Buffett. You know, he, he tends to invest in companies, stick with them and stick with them for the long term. If you have 10 billion, you can do the same thing. Uh, I, I've been involved in helping, uh, you know, families that want to have a family office and uh, one of the things that you can do is, okay, you have five billion. What do you want to do? Well, you know, we have we could do this, we could do that. Why don't you think of investing in fifteen companies? Select them carefully and stick with them. Don't trade them. And over the long term, you have the same diversification or ninety-five percent or ninety percent of the diversification that you would have if you invested left and right. The main thing I find that you have to do in an investment is to control your cost. And, you know, controlling cost is very important. And I know a teacher, I, you know, that's that's the topic maybe we didn't talk, but I, we try to spend a lot of time on making sure that we got good value for the money. I've always remembered, you know, if you invest for 50 years and if your return is 6%, versus 7%, at 7%, you know, $1 <laughs> will grow to $30 in 50 years. But if you only invest at 6%, it will grow to $18. So the first thing is to focus on what you can control. And that's one thing you can control. That's why a small organization, a smaller organization can be more nimble, can find more opportunities and should grab these opportunities. If you look at Yale, they're not, you know, they're not one of the largest funds, but they've done a terrific job by picking, you know, the area where, where they, they can be good at. And, 
you know, that's what it, it comes down to. Uh, you pick an area or two or five where you're really good and try to stick with those. Claude, uh, let me give you a bit of a challenge. Um, assuming now you were in charge of a two billion master trust in the UK, for example, and you need to invest in an environment where you are in a competitive market, you have to sort of compete with others to get the business. And, um, you know, you have the ability to hire some people, but you have to keep costs under control. What sort of strategy would you approach on the investment side? If I have two billion? Yep. I would not rack my brain too much and I would put a lot of it in index fund initially. And, 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 and I would stay there, you know, <laughs> For for a long time, uh, as you grow, then maybe you could you could do different thing. But it, it's not, uh, especially if you if you don't have, you know, you need to be able to hire the right people, and hiring the right people, you need to pay them. And to have a good organization, and that's one of the things that uh, I'm very proud of. Teachers, we attracted people, but we kept them because we paid them uh, decently as compared with, you know, uh, what was traditionally done in pension fund. But if you have two billion, you don't have a lot of money, stick, stick with index fund for, for a long time until you grow a bit and, and then you can dabble. Uh, and it, it's not, it doesn't take a, a huge decision to do that, but most people are afraid to do that. They want to, you know, investment doesn't have to be exciting you know you making money it can be a boring thing and, and you got to stick to a strategy and you know if you cannot absorb one of the things that is dangerous with what i've just said if if you cannot absorb volatility but again a pension fund all the money will not be is not payable tomorrow this money if I look at a pension, it's going to be paid over the next 100 years, you know, when you look at survivor and all of that. So I, I have, you know, a lot of trouble with, you know, some people, you know, yes, you got to meet your liabilities, but we should never forget that the liabilities are not all due tomorrow. They're due over a period of time. And on, on average, you're probably looking at liabilities that will extend easily, uh, you know, for 50, 60 years. So, uh, you know, uh, index fund to me is is a great way. And, and maybe you need some fixed income in that, but uh, it's not, you know, uh, it's not the be all and end out. You know, if you invest in in fixed income today, you get about two, three, four percent less than equity. Uh, so, if you're a long term investor, you got to be in equity somehow. Yeah. Bernard has a question for you. He says, "Is the scheme a defined benefit one, or does it merely have expectations? If the benefits." is defined is not a contractual obligations and if so is not iis frs or gaap correct in setting the discount rules that should be applied at the bond rate at the government bond rate well if i look at the ontario teacher <clears throat> it's a defined benefit plan but if the fund is underfunded today the retirees participate in the risk. And this is an idea that we borrowed from the Dutch. You know, we did not invent it. The first time I saw that, I said, hey, this is a great idea. Uh, and essentially, they get a portion of the inflation, but not all of it. And then there could be a catch-all later on. So to some extent, if you want to reduce your cost and have a stable cost, you know, you need to do these things today, especially when the demography is not a pyramid anymore, but more a rectangle. 
so the, the retirees are, to, are to, you know have to participate in the risk and at Ontario Teachers, my successor, Jim Leach, was able to, to get that done. I think we had started the work before uh, Jim and Barbara Svan did a fabulous job in convincing the teacher and the government that this made sense. And that's one way to reduce the cost of the plan. Because if you want a certain plan, you know, with no, you know, you have to invest in government paper. And the real return bonds today will not provide you much of a pension. So, you know, in life, you got to make some choices. And at least uh, in the province of Ontario, people have made the choice. Retirees have to participate in the risk. And as they grow more and more, it's very important. Claude, a question which I think is interesting. Uh, Oh, we got a question here from Bernard saying, so it's a defined ambition then. It is, but, uh, today it's a defined ambition, but think about most social security plan. They're totally defined ambition. Because unless, you know, if, if a pay as you go system, like a lot of, at least the, the French government has, is a defined ambition. It only works for a while. And eventually, as the population is going to grow, uh, things will have to change. Uh, it's unfortunate, but that's what it is. Uh, and Claude, so to add to that, if, I, if you want certainty, you got to invest in government paper. If you want certainty in inflation protection, you got to invest in real return bonds. And the one thing that I know, if you have a real return bonds that provide you very little, you know, uh, one or two percent, uh, three percent, maybe now, uh, it, this will be very expensive. I think that's a very good comment because we tend to want to tell people it's safe, but also if you don't take enough risk, that's the biggest risk for your pension because you're not going to get what you need because you haven't taken the risk over the time. Uh, there's a question from David here it says, Aside from Ontario teachers, who do you think is doing a great job on investments and why? So you, you can think about it. What are the good examples you have come across in the world? Well, you know, you have mentioned Yale. I mean, that's an endowment, but it's traditionally they've done very, very well. Uh, and, and I think they've been run by really fabulous people. Uh, I look at, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with the Canadian pension funds, and I will say most of them today have done a really good job. The Canada Pension Plan has probably half a trillion dollar. They've done a fabulous job in investing the money. Uh, you know, they, they, they've, they've built a, a strong team. Uh, they've, they have a strong board. Uh, they're, you know, they're not risk adverse. They think long term. Uh, you know, to me, that that's a great example of funding a pension fund. And by the way, the Canada pension funds, most people think it's fully funded. The assets of the plan only cover 30% of the current liabilities. So, you know, how, how does the government says, well, this is fully funded? Well, you gotta, you got to account for all the future contributions of the current contributor and you got to go forward 150 years and then you have a, a so-called plan that is in balance. But most Canadian pension funds today are aware of the right recipe. Good board, invest internally, watch your expenses, watch your turnover of your employees, try to keep them as much as possible. Uh, an example not to follow, I, I, I'm familiar also with the American pension plan, where it's the opposite. The, in the US, you have the best investment people in the world, some of the best pension, but the pension plans are badly managed. In most of them, in part, it's because of weak boards. It's in part because of weak management. It's, you know, many people involved with these plans have gone to jail. So, you know, 
again, I can give you example. The Dutch have done a really good job in general. Uh, the government may be a little bit more uh, conservative than, than I, I think they should be. Uh, but uh, in general, they've done a, a great job. Uh, I'm not as familiar, I think, with the Nordic country, but uh, I understand that, that you know, they, they, they do a good job. UK has, uh, you know, has some good pension funds. Uh, so it, it's not a monopoly from Canada, but certainly the Canadian model is not a bad one where you have <laughs> good board, good management, pay them, make sure that they stay with you, watch your expenses, take some risk, do some, you know, more investment uh, internally than externally. Uh, you know, when, when people invest in private equity uh, outside, don't forget the cost is between 5 to 7%. So that means that these, fr these funds, and today, the opportunities are not what they were 25 years ago, you know, far from it. So you're paying a lot of money to to somebody else, like six, seven percent. When you don't, if you don't want to do that internally, that's what you're faced with. And you know, I I I don't think I gave you a specific example, but read the annual report of most Canadian pension fund. You'll see that they do a decent job. And Claude, you have now answered a lot of our questions. So it's time for you to ask a question to the next speaker, who is Arun Moral Dilhar, and he will come on March 23rd. And he's worked with Merton quite a lot on the retirement income bonds. And the government of Brazil recently announced they should issue it. So Claude, what is your question to Arun? My question to Arun is a very simple one. I think the idea that they have is a good one, and I have never been exposed to it. But the problem that I see is what kind of pension will this new idea will generate? If I look at the return of bonds, you know, especially government bonds over the long term, it's, as I have mentioned before, three to 4% lower than equity. And every 1% that you reduced a pension fund, every 1% you don't get, that means that the pension is reduced by about 20, 25%. So what kind of pensions will they hope to get? And, you know, I, th I think it will be interesting to see uh, these ideas in, in, in application. You know, in Brazil, they have high inflation. Uh, so it, maybe it will look good, but on a real pension basis, when, when you take cost of living into account, it may, may not be as good as people think. But, uh, you know, at least for most developed countries, real returns are not very low, and it's very tough to, uh, to have a decent pension with that. Thank you, Claude. I would like to thank, first of all, everyone in the audience for coming and asking your questions. And it's been really good to get these challenging questions to Claude. And I also would like to thank you, Claude, for being here. I've learned a lot from you and I think you're very inspiring and, and a good challenger and you show things can be done differently. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was a pleasure to have you here today. Well, thank you, Stefan, and I've learned a lot from the Dutch over the years, so I owe them, you know, a, a lot of credit because, you know, you, you got to borrow ideas to make uh, things, to, to have a bit of success. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and looking forward to see you next time on Pioneering Pensions.